you measure uh, amount of light that you can get you can get uh, from, uh, from from each unit of work. Uh, and that's in part the story of, uh, of modern economics, where in many dimensions we've become far more productive and enjoy lives of plenty and well-being that our ancestors uh, just could barely have dreamed of. Uh, we are far less likely, to have to go through the agony of burying a child, far less likely to go to bed hungry at night, uh, far less likely to suffer a violent death. Now, and the story of economics uh, is uh, is partly is is intertwined in that. So the shortest history of economics is partly the story of the world through the lens of economics, and partly the story of uh, one of my one of the most interesting disciplines around, and my favourite social science. Well, thank you, Andrew. Now, you certainly don't subscribe to the idea that economics is the dismal science at all so and I was thinking I mean one of your heroines would be Joan Robinson and she was quoted recently in the speech by Rachel Reeves who's the, ch the shadow chancellor in the United Kingdom and on the, the the great challenge of bringing value into economics of making an economy work for people and for human needs so would you expand on that? I mean, that's surely the vision, the purpose of your professional life. Absolutely, Janet. Uh, I'm a passionate Labor person, and so this isn't uh, a dispassionate history of the discipline. Uh, I can't uh, let your uh, your uh, pertinent question go without also commenting for people's interest on the the phrase "the dismal science." Uh, that's actually a tag which uh, came from Thomas Carlyle. Um, who saw economists as dismal because we had the view, dismal as he thought it, that all people are equal uh, and that slavery was wrong. Uh, Carlyle was a racist. He supported slavery. Uh, and if somebody like that calls economics the dismal science, well, I'm happy to happy to claim the brand of dismal. Uh, but you talked uh, not about the uh, the blokes, but about one of the uh, the core women in economics. And, and one of the things I'm trying to do with the shortest history of economics is to tell more of the stories of the young sung women in the discipline. Joan Robinson was uh, a remarkable scholar uh, who should have been the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for economics. Uh, Business Week actually ran a profile of her, uh, but uh, thinking that she was going to win the prize, but she didn't get there. Uh, she came up with, uh, she focused a lot on uh, market imperfections, uh, mon monopoly power, which was uh, recognized, but she expanded on. But also she coined the term monopsony, the idea that uh, a big firm might not just hurt its consumers, but also hurt its suppliers. Uh, and that's highly relevant today as we look at, for example, at the way in which large supermarkets can squeeze their suppliers, the farmers, as much as they squeeze the consumers in their stores. Well, I was thinking tonight in this session, we really should focus on economics for labour rights. And and mon monops mon so I always have trouble pronouncing monopsony is one of those particularly valuable ideas because of the way where all it also plays in controlling wages. Um, Absolutely, and, uh, it's a different way of thinking about why the workers have got much less bargaining power. Could you expand on that? Yeah, absolutely, Janet. So uh, in that context, the workers are suppliers to firms. Uh, and in the uh, the worst case is that of a one company town. Uh, if uh, you're in a place where there's only one employer, uh, chances are that you will get uh, a lower wage, just as you would if you were buying things in a monopoly where there was only one supplier. And this is uh, increasingly thought to be one of the reasons why wages might be lower in regional areas, uh, because if you're in a regional town, there's just fewer employers, and so potentially they exert market power in hiring. And it might be too that in certain sectors, uh, workers don't get a fair, fair wage uh, because there's only a couple of employers or indeed because the employers collude. So we saw some years back uh, a deal between a number of the big tech firms not to poach each other's workers uh, because they decided it was in their collective interest to keep wages low. Uh, there's non-compete clauses in one in, in the uh, employment contracts of one in five Australian workers, uh, and uh, increasingly there's a view that those non-compete clauses uh, might might be one of the reasons why we've had such lousy growth in real wages in Australia over the past decade. 
Well, thank you. Uh, we're going to jump all over the place in time, but I mean, just right. to indicate to readers that um, this wonderful book starts at the very beginning of the very beginning of human society, um, because the story of economics begins with the development of societies where people could specialise in parts of food production. Now, I mean, I think the traditional argument has been in the past, which I think a lot of the deep history and anthropology was dominated by the imperial age, and they all thought in terms of empires. And I think now the scholarship is looking much more at the uh, much more haphazard uh, incremental growth of different types of production in different in societies, um, and in which Aboriginal tradition or agricultural dispersed horticulture has a, a very important place. Um, but it's the development of, of specialised specialisms, and that specialisation is one of the simple concepts. You so specialisation occurs through the industrial, through, through the agricultural revolution first, uh, a couple of thousand years ago, uh, when suddenly uh, societies turned from being nomadic to being settled. The settled agriculture is more productive and allows societies to uh, expand their populations much more rapidly, although per person well-being doesn't go up a great deal. Uh, and that surplus uh, creates the potential for specialisation. You begin to get artisans, uh, you get a uh, class of, uh, of parasites who, uh, who live off the surplus. Uh, we might call them politicians in the modern era. Uh, and these are uh, and you get the uh, the advent of uh, of standing armies. Uh, you also see specialisation occur uh, in unusual ways. Uh, so, for example, societies that uh, invent plough based agriculture tend to become much more male dominated because the plough requires more physical strength. Uh, and then you get the specialisation of uh, males into agriculture uh, and females into uh, into other sectors of uh, production. Uh, but specialisation, of course, is the basis for uh, for trade. Uh, trade between nations happens because we have uh, specialisation, uh, and that's something that's uh, that's recognised very early on uh, as uh, as people tra do do trade by foot or by cart, uh, and even more commonly by ocean going travel, which is far more efficient in those early uh, early centuries. I was thinking about getting on to trade because again, I think perhaps. In recent years, it's become a bit of a dirty word for people in the labour movement because somehow that's to do with America and trade agreements and bad things. But societies have, have trade has been essential and essential to the spread of knowledge and experience and learning. Uh, and this is where geography plays such an important role. And uh, the Levant uh, and the whole area of the Mediterranean, which is an area that actually and each group doesn't isn't very good at producing enough food for itself. Has always had to live by trade, which is one of the reasons it's such a dynamic and creative part of the world for so long. Yes, that's right. And, and yeah. the Levant is really interesting because uh, the uh, agricultural revolution in that period uh, comes as a result of uh, what are known as the eight founder crops. Emma wheat, icon wheat, hulled barley, peas, lentils, bitter vitch, chickpeas and flax. And, flax. Uh, and you see out of the Levant, that so-called fertile crescent, uh, a rapid improvement in uh, uh, the, uh, the productivity of farms and, and therefore a big increase uh, in, the, uh, in, in the population in that, in that period. Now, could we take a flight across the whole of Eurasia to China? Um, whereas a very different sort of dynamic, China's got the good fortune to have rice, which was as better, as good a producer of calories, was not only to be matched by the potato eventually. So China's got this extraordinarily productive food and they work out very early a brilliant way of, of farming it with paddy fields. So China is actually extraordinarily self-sufficient. Absolutely. And it doesn't need to trade in the same way that the people in the West do. Yes, I mean, that's uh, one of the advantages of being a larger country. Uh, the bigger you are, the less advantage you get from trade because 
uh, you can do more things internally. So trade's always going to be more important to a, a medium-sized country like Australia uh, than it is to uh, the, the mega economies of the United States or uh, uh, China. Uh, China in the uh, in in the early period uh, of of the uh, of the millennium, um, think kind of uh, uh, first to, to to fifth century uh, AD, uh, invented all kinds of uh, of things. You had silk cloth, you had uh, uh, items made of bronze and steel, you had paper for writing, uh, but surprisingly few of those innovations end up being used. Uh, to transform the economy. Uh, they end up being uh, uh, making a lot of toys, uh, but fewer uh, trans transformative you know, innovations uh, and, uh, and practical tools that make the life, life easy. And, and one of the theories here, Janet, mm. uh, is that when you've got uh, an almost infinite pool of labour, there's less incentive to innovate uh, than when labour is scarce. Now can we move to theft? Uh, and the uh, extraordinary theft of the outside world's resources that begins with um, to Christopher Columbus happening upon the United States, which for the Europeans was like discovering a whole new planet, um, which had all these trees and natural resources and, of course, all that gold. I'll ask you about Spanish gold in a minute. Um, but the the way in which... The West, because it had certain advantages in shipping and in and navigation, was able to plunder the rest of the world and also to start the first factory system using African human muscle in the Caribbean to produce sugar and the way in which Europe got rich by theft. Yes, yeah, so Columbus's voyage is enabled by some big advantage, big changes in uh, shipping technology. Uh, you've got three masted ships, you've got sturdier hulls, you've got advances in sails so you can tack into the wind. Uh, you've got better compasses, better maps, better understanding of wind patterns, all of which makes longer sea voyages uh, uh, more uh, more possible. Uh, Columbus, though, of course, thinks that uh, uh, he's. Uh, he, he only only needs to uh, uh, sail off to the west, and he will reach India and China, uh, and that's why the uh, the first uh, places he uh, he reaches he, he names the West Indies, uh, thinking that he's uh, just on the way to India. Uh, of course, he's about to run into uh, continental United States, uh, and uh, is nowhere nowhere near India at that point. Uh, but he then establishes a uh, trade. Uh, which is enormously profitable and beneficial to the colonial countries, uh, far less so for the uh, for, for the inhabitants of the countries that he arrives in. Uh, his he and his troops bring smallpox, measles, measles, influenza, and chickenpox, and in some places the death rate is up to eighty percent. Uh, you then have the rise of slavery, uh, that abominable uh, trade. Uh, which sees more than 12 million people trafficked across the Atlantic uh, in a uh, in a triangle where you've got uh, slaves being taken across, uh, uh, valuable uh, gold and silver being taken out, as you mentioned before there, Janet, uh, and uh, and small amounts of uh, uh, manufactured products being brought back. Um, well, so what what did gold do to Spain? Well, gold is interesting because as it arrives in Spain, it uh, it tra transforms the price level. Uh, so suddenly, uh, you it's it's almost the equivalent of uh, a modern government turning on the printing presses. Uh, you have a huge increase in the prices of goods and services. Uh, you therefore have uh, a big increase in imports, but it completely destroys the export sector. So Spain, which has been uh, one of the wealthiest nations in the world in 1500 uh, turns into effectively an economic backwater two centuries later. Uh, it's uh, it's almost the modern echo of the so-called resource curse. Uh, they take they bring in so much gold and silver uh, that their economy can't uh, uh, compete in the world. But in a way, too, the the slave trade and the Caribbean and the sugar trade and the the triangle of wealth transfer between Africa, West Indies and, and Britain and Europe, rest, uh, in Western Europe um, 
it's Sweetness and Power is the name of a wonderful book on it. Um, mm. And they get the revenge in that we're all fat and got rotten teeth. And so the the uh, impact of sugar uh, on the Western diet has, has actually been very, very grave. And we're really seeing that now. Um, but but it's a small punishment for what we did. Uh, the other big theft comes from India, doesn't it? And the uh, dishonourable East India Company um, taking incredible amounts of money out of out of India. I think the estimate now is thirty trillion pounds worth um, of wealth stolen from India, um, and by importing things which they actually never paid for. They made the Indians pay for the things they imported. Yes, the power of the British East India Company is remarkable. So it, it controls two-thirds of the Indian subcontinent at one point. And, and when we think about the Indian subcontinent, we're talking about modern-day India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Uh, it's the British East India Company's tea that's dumped into Boston Harbour that starts the American Revolution. It's conflict over the British East India Company's opium sales to China that sparks the opium wars. Uh, the uh, tea merchant Thomas Twining got his start working for the British East India Company, uh, as did uh, university benefactor Elihud y Yale, um, who uh, uh, got fired from the British East India Company for corruption and then took his ill-gotten gains to start Yale University. Lovely. Um, so just pushing forward in time now, we get to the beginning of the eight, uh, 19th century, um, sorry, the beginning of the 18th century, and really by that time, India, China and Europe are equal, a level in terms of wealth. And within 300 years, they've been turned into, India and China were turned into third world economies. So the impoverishment of two thirds of the world, in a sense, just by Europe, was an extraordinary thing. And the driving thing of that is also the Industrial Revolution, which is funded by that ill-gotten gains from the colonies. Yes, I mean, you've got the Opium Wars in which uh, uh, the co colonial powers are basically enabling the drug dealers, uh, insisting that uh, China's markets stay open to uh, to opium being imported by, uh, by continental, uh, by colonial powers. Uh, and then, as you say, Janet, you've got the Industrial Revolution, uh, which causes a growth takeoff uh, unprecedented in human history. Uh, it doesn't cause uh, the what we now call developing countries to get poorer, uh, but they don't share in its wealth as, uh, as they should have done. Uh, and where, where the agricultural revolution increased the number of people, although not didn't have very much impact on individuals' living standards, the Industrial Revolution increases per person living standards. So suddenly you see these uh, increases in heights, you see the improvements in diets, uh, you see the uh, benefit, benefits to uh, first Britain's economy and then a whole range of, uh, of economies in advanced countries. Uh, and, uh, and it's driven by uh, a set of what you can think of as interlocking revolutions. Uh, there's a revolution in gadgets, a whole lot of innovations, the steam engine best known among them, uh, things like the spinning jenny. Uh, you've got a revolution in, uh, in uh, urbanisation. Uh, Britain's very highly urbanised, uh, and that helps the Industrial Revolution as well. Now, and you've got a revolution in terms of uh, the rule of law. And so the uh, way in which the British courts operate and their attitude to property rights uh, is very favourable to the innovators that are fueling the Industrial Revolution. And you've also got, in a sense, the enslavement of the people in Europe themselves and the British into the industrial working class. So uh, the ancestors of many people on this call were finding themselves in mines and cotton mills um, and they're enslaved in their own way. Um, but the other big story, which is the labour story, is the way in which people fought back and clawed back over 150 years or longer have been clawing back some of that wealth through political movements. That's right. And so you've got the uh, Toll Puddle Martyrs, uh, early trade unionists who got together and uh, uh, campaigned for, uh, for workers' rights, ultimately uh, uh, suffering the punishment of being transported to Australia. Uh, and a, a petition finally has them 
brought back to uh, to Britain. Uh, but that's the the beginnings of uh, of workers' movements in the UK. Uh, in Australia, you had even stronger workers' movements, uh, and that's partly because labour was scarcer here. Uh, when uh, when labour is scarcer, it's able to command a higher value, uh, and also collective action tends to come more readily. Uh, so by the end of the 1800s, you've got Australian workers earning higher wages than workers anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that's in, in part due to the, uh, the power of collective action. So what a, let's talk about finance because you've got a wonderful, if not, I found quite difficult chapter because I, on on inflation because uh, I think, you know, if growing, in the 80s, that was what everyone was talking about. And the 70s, that, you know, this is where, sorry, I should go back. I mean, the thing which broke those colonies or broke the British colony is first the First World War. Then there's the Depression, then the Second World War. So that broke British power and wealth, which has switched to paper wealth in terms of financialization. Um, and so what we've got is a world in which after the two world wars, we've got these 30 glorious years, the Trente Glorieuses, as the French call them. Um, and that's the time in which for the first time, according to Piketty, um, the animal spirits of capital, its, its ability to grow out, to always outgrow production and productivity, um, were restrained by high marginal taxation. Could you talk a bit about that period? Because we can look back on it now. I mean, you know, everyone looks back and thinks it was Mr. Menzies, uh, but it wasn't. It was the impact of the realisation during the war that people now had to really cough up and pay if we were to get through the war. Yes, it's a remarkable period and a reminder that uh, growth and equity can go together. Uh, this is a period, as you've said, Janet, in which organised labour campaigned for uh, better better wages on the factory floor and, and wages grew faster on the factory floor than the corner office. Uh, you saw uh, broadly shared prosperity, a uh, big increase in the share of households who had items such as a washing machine uh, or uh, were able to access an automobile. Uh, and that, uh, that sense of shared prosperity is partly a function of organised labour, partly a function of uh, uh, the growth of the, the welfare state partly a function of the uh, the progressive taxation systems that emerge in that era. And it's all happening in a crucible of, uh, uh, the, uh, of World War II, uh, an environment in which many of those coming back from the war decided that they didn't want to, that, that they, they had fought for a better world, and that better world involved a, a fairer deal for working people. Now, if this period isn't utopia by any means. It was a pretty tough time to be... Uh, female, gay, or a minority, uh, but it's important to realise the uh, egalitarianism that flowed out of, out of that era, not just in Australia, but in, in many other advanced countries too. Now, um, that all ends when we get the revolt of the rich, in a sense, really coming from the what's called the neoliberalism, but it's really a revolt of, of re resentment of paying these high rates of taxation. There's a move to the private sector as being privileged. That uh, is a very long campaign, which had begun in the 1920s, a wonderful book uh, about that by Naomi Reskes, um, uh, about the way and the big myth, uh, trying to teach people that the state was, was evil and it was the enemy of democracy. Um, and so you've got a, a loss of confidence and faith in the state, and that's equated with communism and Joe Stalin and all those things, all this fantasy nonsense. Um, but what it did was, in fact, profoundly impoverish the public sector. Uh, and perhaps we're not so badly off here, but you can certainly see in England now the impoverishment of the whole society where the, the lack of investment in infrastructure and education and the very things which they really had going for them still are now falling apart. Similarly in the United States, their bridges are falling down. Their, their, their roads don't work. Um, the, the failure to invest. Um, and contrast that with the Chinese way now, which you talk about the economist Lin, 
um, and the different path he saw going from Taiwan to China um, and then going into the IMF and so on. Could you talk about him and his vision of how you actually do an economy sensibly in the modern world? Yes, Justin Lin is a fascinating character a, uh, uh, who, as a young man, is serving in the Taiwanese army when he decides that he will defect to mainland China. Uh, he uh, finds a time when he's serving on an island that is just three kilometres from the Chinese mainland. He tells his men that he's heard there might be a disturbance that night, so if they see anything in the water, then they shouldn't shoot. And then he strips off his uniform and swims to the mainland. Uh, he's lucky that he encounters a, an Ameri visiting American economist and serves as a translator and then wins a scholarship to the University of Chicago, where he does his PhD. And Justin Lin's uh, approach to economics is that uh, there can be uh, moments at which it's appropriate for the state to intervene, uh, to kickstart particular industries, and also to provide uh, the uh, investment in human capital. Uh, and in that sense, that's, uh, that's a, a model that he seeks to uh, uh, propagate when he's the world becomes the World Bank's chief uh, chief economist, uh, and in some sense, as you've said, Janet, uh, sits at odds with that pure free market ideology that characterised uh, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan uh, in the U UK and the US, respectively, in the early nineteen eighties, and which we've seen in our country, and from John Howard onward, the d diminishing investment in universities in this country, the and the the fall off we've had in innovation and productivity as a consequence of spending so little on R&D. So, you know, we, we've suffered that too, and we've got to drag ourselves out of that hole. Now, we've been talking about this broad space, but there's, a, there's an elephant in the room, which as we go back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, what really made that possible was a revolution in energy, which is the movement from a, an organic economy based on living wood to fossilised carbon in coal and later oil. This produces an extraordinary transformation because of the volume of energy that can be produced because suddenly you're tapping into th millions of years of stored carbon rather than relying on something that's been growing in the last 60 years. But you've also then released that carbon into the atmosphere. So while we've been having this extraordinary growth um, and with that has come extraordinary growth of population also as a result of our technological success in that particularly it's in reducing infant mortality and enabling most of the babies that are born to live uh, and who then grow up and have babies that the, the growth in world population has been so explosive uh, since the Second World War. I mean, in my lifetime, the population will have, world population will have trebled. So we've now got this situation where we're, we've, we've not, in a sense, what used to be called the limits of growth, but you've got a very interesting story in how, in fact, Mal Malthus's predictions, gloomy predictions about the limitations of what human beings can do within their environment um, and what the and the beliefs concerns about the limits of growth have had were overturned by technology. So we're not necessarily trapped in the way that we thought we were, and a lot of people still think we are. Can we still have growth uh, and not blow ourselves up? Well, Janet, it's it's such an important question, and if all growth involved uh, increases in the amount of physical stuff. Uh, then it would be true that ultimately uh, we would reach the carrying capacity of the planet and uh, further growth would uh, would si would simply uh, uh, degrade the natural environment to an impossible extent. Uh, but in fact, most growth in a services economy is actually uh, due to people uh, producing weightless output more productively. Uh, think about the growth that flows from a teacher who's better able to convey information, uh, a doctor who's able to heal heal people more quickly, uh, an energy plant that's able to produce more uh, for the same level of inputs. That's the, that sort of growth is entirely sustainable. 
uh, but we've uh, got to tackle the uh, the challenge of, uh, of climate change. Now, one of the things I deliberately did in the book uh, was to refer to coal-powered steam engines, not just to steam engines, because when you talk about the steam engine, it makes you think about a uh, uh, the stuff that uh, that surrounds you in the shower. Uh, if you uh, if you think about coal-powered steam engines, suddenly you're reminded that this uh, driver of the industrial revolution was also causing massive environmental damage. Mm. Uh, Nicholas Stern called climate change the world's biggest market failure, uh, and noted that. Uh, if we acted, then we would be able to, for, to uh, forestall some of its worst effects. The world hasn't acted as swiftly as we should have done, uh, but we're, we're st steadily getting there now. And you can see carbon, the, the increasing, the, the rate of increase in carbon emissions to get decreasing. Of course, that's not enough. We need to actually have carbon emissions decreasing and then be thinking about how to get carbon out of the atmosphere and the rest. Now, it is a huge challenge, but the later we act, as Nicholas Stern told us, the more expensive it becomes. So for Labor people, for Labourites, what are the economics that they need to be using in their everyday thinking? And it's, and it's also particularly, and I think this is one of the missions of the Labor Academy, that when we're campaigning, when we're talking to the community, to start to be able to explain things better to people, because at the moment there's a very, it's a, a quite severe lack of comprehension, and a, we perhaps could talk about property prices um, and how they've, um, in a sense, really come from the sloshing around of huge amounts of excess capital, mm -hmm. which had nowhere, which was not being sent to productive places like infrastructure. Um, or education and research. So it's got to go somewhere. They're investing it in property, which just becomes ever more expensive. Property prices are never going to go down. So that's a false hope. We've got to build an alternative housing system or people won't be housed. But to understand why the value of land, which is getting also scarce, even in Australia, um, is now making it impossible to think in terms of, of uh, making that sort of thing more affordable. Yes, so, I mean, as they say about land, they're not making it anymore. And so that's uh, one of the factors that can potentially drive up its price. Uh, but you can also see effects of planning and zoning playing in here. And, and that's why that's that's been a, a priority uh, for the Commonwealth Government as we've, uh, we've talked to the states about how to handle things. And one of the uh, challenges, I think, Janet, is the perspective that Australians have had towards property. Uh, if you look to a country like Germany, uh, people have generally regarded housing as being a consumption good. In Australia, we've regarded it as both consumption and investment good. And once you start seeing housing as uh, both investment and consumption, then there's a, a tendency of investors to pile in and, and drive the prices up. Uh, so, you know, you look at the uh, house price to income ratios in Australia, and you know they've more than doubled over the course of uh, of the last generation. Uh, that's a real problem for uh, wealth inequality and for intergenerational equity in Australia. So, the, in the way we're talking to people, um, we've got to start talking about, and I think about how the sort of economics Labor cares about and tries to do is an economic system that is socialised to the extent that it doesn't hurt people. It's for their benefit. It doesn't exploit them. It doesn't cause harm. Um, and it encourages the right sort of growth. It probably sounds all very woolly to people, but it's a very real commitment in the labour movement, isn't it? It really is. And, and I would also look to challenge some of the, uh, the economics of the labour movement as well. Uh, I think uh, it is absolutely important to celebrate collective action, the government, the government's role in a strong welfare state and as a risk manager. Uh, but if I'm being critical of our own movement, I think we should always try and look at areas we can do better. Uh, I think sometimes uh, Labor people have been uh, too down on the benefits of openness for creating prosperity. Trade has been a terrific driver of growth. Uh, and if we want investment, then foreign investment is go going to be a part of that. 
Uh, we've also been a little too sceptical at times of competition uh, and the uh, people who can suffer most from uncompetitive markets are often some of the poorest. Uh, it's people who can't afford a car to drive to the next suburb to get a better deal or don't have the social networks to discover uh, which firm is offering the best price. Uh, so competitive markets uh, can be extraordinarily important for the most vulnerable. Uh, and we talked before about Joan Robinson's notion of monopsony power, suggesting that uncompetitive markets can hurt workers as well. Uh, so there's nothing to be celebrated from a labour perspective uh, from a, a big monopoly. Uh, and uh, and we that's that's one of recognising that is, is, I hope, one of the things that, uh, that uh, um, progressive economists will do more and more in future. So the economics of the common good is a growing movement. Uh, could you, would, have you had any thoughts about that? Yes, I think that's a, a lovely way of, uh, of encapsulating things. Uh, and it also reflects the way in which uh, government can play important roles in society. I talked about government as risk manager before, which, which captures a lot of what we do. You know, government as risk manager explains why we have a uh, uh, public health care system against the risk of falling ill describes why we have a progressive uh, edu education system uh, against the uh, the risk of uh, uh, bright children not having not having affluent parents and and therefore all the prosperity we would lose uh, if ever all the education system was private uh, but there's also uh, government as as risk manager in tackling climate change uh, which is of course a, a massive risk that the, that the, the planet faces uh, the role of government there uh, in keeping keeping us safe from the uh, very worst effects of climate change uh, really really matters too. Well, can we finish up when your most dismal book, which is the one about risks that we face as a, as a global scale, and that you really see AI as being perhaps the most unnerving risk for the future? Yes, in what's the worst that could happen? I made the case that uh, there isn't another technology where uh, those working on it think that there is, on average, a 5% chance that it will spell the end of humanity. Uh, not even those working on nuclear weapons thought that this there was a 1 in 20 chance it could end the world. Uh, but that's the view of AI scientists. So I think it's important to uh, do what we can to reduce that risk. Artificial intelligence has huge potential to turbocharge productivity. And indeed, some of the early studies suggest that the uh, that artificial intelligence tools could even have an equalizing effect in the workplace, uh, benefiting the lowest performers uh, even more than the uh, top performers. That's all to the good. But we also need to make sure that super intelligent machines don't suddenly take, uh, take over the world. Uh, Terminator is not a likely scenario, but it's a possible scenario. Uh, we need to change that, make sure it's an impossible scenario, uh, and then enjoy the benefits that can flow uh, from artificial intelligence. On that note, we shall now turn to the human intelligence of the audience and for, open up right. for questions. Kimberly, we've got, I think, just waiting on our... I think we've got a question coming from uh, Lachlan Kerwood McCall. Thank you, Janet, and thank you, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, and to an extent, it's a bit of a um, Captain Obvious because it's sort of um, you've covered it. I think particularly in your um, last comment about how um, the progressive movement needs to embrace uh, the progressive case for competition, and um, I'll admit, um, uh, I think what your paper with. Um, uh, Adam Triggs a number of years ago on um, competition and inequality, I think was a was a particularly strong um, contribution on on that. Um, I was wondering if you could, uh, I suppose, reflect on uh, I guess the long arc of, of of productivity growth and the productivity growth trends and where we're heading. Because obviously we've just had a pretty dismal decade. Um, I'm sure you've read um, Robert Gordon's um, book from a few years ago where he essentially said. Um, the low-hanging fruit's been picked. The, the Industrial Revolution was the big bang productivity reform agenda, and, and from there on, everything else is kind of just sort of piecemeal uh, tinkering. Sorry, that's my cat um, 
in the background. And I mean, um, you know, I was sort of particularly struck I, when I was uh, working in the um, public service under the, the last government, the number of times productivity enhancing reforms would get knocked back for this reason or that reason. But the most common reason was usually um, fiscal conservatism. You know, we could do this or we could do that. Um, but but it's not but it's not it's not deficit neutral even if it will expand pro, um, productivity growth and and I mean a comment that really stuck with me as an undergrad was um, when Ken Henry the year after he retired as Treasury Secretary was asked why has the the Henry Tax Review fallen apart why has the Gillard and before that the Rudd government struggled so much with the mining tax and he said the number one challenge facing would be economic reformers is we don't have the revenue to buy off the losers of reform. Um, Obviously, there are various ways you can sort of um, um, interpret that. But um, how do we essentially uh, avoid? How do how do we essentially build the case within the progressive movement for, I suppose, you not know, say as a trade unionist as an, and as a socialist? Um, is there a, a progressive and a, dare I say a leftist case um, for productivity reform? And how do we make sure that in the decade to come, um, the productivity agenda isn't derailed by a lot of the things that have that certainly derailed it under the last government and have derailed it for, for quite some time now. Andrew. Uh, Lachlan, that is a wonderfully big and wide-ranging uh, question. Uh, I wouldn't expect any less for, less from you. And and I love that you've, you've spotlighted productivity because it, it really has become a dirty word on our side of politics, hasn't it? Uh, too many people think of productivity as being working longer for the same, same amount of money. They think that uh, when they hear productivity, it's about, uh, having to respond to the boss at all hours. Uh, what we need to do, though, is to, to understand that productivity does have a central role in the labour story. Uh, if we want to get wage gains, ultimately they're going to come uh, in a sustainable basis from productivity improvements. Uh, productivity is the reason that the typical Australian now earns in a day uh, what someone of 1901 earned in a week in buying power terms. Uh, and part of it, I think, is uh, is about uh, capturing the ingenuity of the workforce. Uh, I remember a, a mining company, of all things, telling me a couple of years back uh, that they'd started a competition called Have a Crack, uh, in which they asked all of their workers to come up with a productivity boosting idea and paid 50,000 bucks for the best of them. Uh, that was an idea which had to do with how they reduced the amount of uh, iron ore that they had to deposit in big piles at the port uh, and managed to maximise the amount that went straight onto the ship. Uh, they paid 50 grand for it. Uh, they said that uh, it was worth multiples of that for their bottom line. But what's inherent in that is saying you've got a lot of wisdom in your workforce. The wisdom doesn't all re reside in the management. Uh, it's also in the workers. Uh, so thinking about smart ways of getting your workforce to work with you and boosting productivity, that's really where it's at. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic about the potential of artificial intelligence. That's what we call a, a general purpose technology. So like the coal-fired steam engine, like electricity, artificial intelligence does have the potential to turbocharge productivity and to boost the productivity the most uh, of those who are uh, current, currently struggling in their work. Uh, but only if we deploy it right. And there is a risk, uh, you mentioned competition, that artificial intelligence engines become dominated by a single player, much as internet search has done. So we need to keep a competition lens on it and an egalitarian lens on it if we're to make sure that uh, artificial intelligence really does the very most for those who we care about the most. Thank you. Another question. Kimberly, have we got another hand up? Ken Marriott and, and got Pat. Ken. Hello. You need to switch your sound on. Um, sorry, we're a couple of us. It's not Ken Murray, it's Charming and God. Um, I'd just like to know, do we need to develop policies, very short question, where robotics are taxed or AI is taxed because it's becoming part of the production system and it's replacing human effort? No, thanks very much. I think it's a, it's an interesting question. You had, you had um, Bill Gates calling for a, a a robot tax a couple of a couple of years back. So uh, the idea is is not uh, not sitting on the just on the fringes. I'm always a little uh, skeptical about calls to tax innovation because 
it's innovation that's often the driver of, uh, of productivity growth. Uh, so to identify the most productive industries and slap attacks on them risks dragging us back from the potential there. Uh, if you're looking for the most efficient taxes, according to economists, uh, well, most economists would say that the least deadweight burden is in a land tax. Uh, and the most is uh, is potentially uh, an attacks on on innov innovation, which which ideally you want more of. You now we have a research and development tax credit uh, because we want to encourage firms who are doing the most research and development. Uh, but at the same time, we need to make sure there's appropriate guardrails around it. The work that Ed Husick's doing in the case of artificial intelligence is really important, bringing together uh, the users and the producers of artificial intelligence engines uh, to make sure that it doesn't impede privacy, that it doesn't breach copyright, uh, that it is being carried out in an appropriate ethical framework. Uh, but if you've played with these tools, you can see the, uh, the immediate benefits of them and the rapid pace at which they're improving. Uh, I love sitting down with my 11-year-old and doing uh, artificial intelligence art. Uh, I've taken to doing a range of my statistical analysis using the chat GPT's data ana analysis tools. Uh, one study of management consultants found that they uh, did a randomised trial and found that those randomly selected to use uh, chat GPT produced work 25% quicker. That was 40% better. Uh, I don't know any other tool that produces such a big productivity gain. So if we get the ethics and the egalitarian framework right, uh, this is a really exciting moment for us. Uh, but as you say, that's a big if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess what, what concerns me a little bit is the substitution effect for workers. And I think that Labor maybe needs to look at that. And I actually beeped. Bill Gates on this because I sat next to Julia Gillard at a dinner in about 1997 and I said in the future we need to tax robotics. <laughs> yes I mean at its best what you what you're seeing is the automation of uh, dangerous jobs so I think we'd all we'd all prefer that if you're in the bomb di bomb disposal squad that it is a robot rather than a human that is uh, going out and doing a job like that. Uh, dirty jobs in, ca in the case of sewerage cleaning, uh, dangerous jobs involving going into confined places. Uh, mine sites are, uh, are using uh, robotics in, in quite careful ways. So I remember going into one of the remote operating centres that was being, uh, being run by uh, Rio Tinto and chatting to a person there who said, look, I've sat on top of the machine uh, that I'm currently operating remotely. Uh, it hurt my back a lot. Uh, and uh, and I had to come to, go up and down whenever I needed to go to the toilet. He said it was one of the most unpleasant jobs I've ever done. Now I sit in an air-conditioned room and operate the machine machine remotely, uh, and I get to go home to my family at night. So mm -hmm. he, he unambiguously was saying that he had a better job as a result of the technology that was enabling it. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to put a tax on that, but I would want to think carefully uh, about making sure that we're as a government encouraging the sort of innovative industries that will continue to create jobs. And um, what's remarkable now is having unemployment at 3.7%. Uh, I never thought I'd see unemployment that low in my lifetime. And, and we should be cheering that as a, as a labor movement. Hmm. Now we've got Toby Walsh. Could you Hello, Andrew. Um, G'day, Toby. I've got, a, I've got a related question really in terms of See, see, seeing the benefits from from technologies like AI, which is, could you say something about the government's role in investing, especially in foundational technologies, and also about the investment climate in general, um, in terms of R and D within Australia? I mean, you've talked talked about you know, there are R and D incentives, but we do see government investment in research and development at somewhat low levels, and we see certainly corporations um, not investing in Australia at the rates they invest in overseas places. Absolutely. Am I allowed to also say, talk about the books you're working on? <laughs> you can, yes, certainly. So uh, Toby Walsh, the, the Shortest History of Economics is in a series that Black, Black Inc. has done, Shortest History of Democracy, Shortest History of the World, Shortest History of Germany. Uh, and in coming years, you'll be treated to Toby Walsh's book on the shortest history of artificial intelligence. It will be out and on the 1st of May next year. 
<laughs> May next year. Fantastic. Coming from uh, one of Australia's uh, experts in artificial intelligence, uh, this is uh, guaranteed to be a rollicking read. Um, yeah, what worries me, Toby, is... Uh, not so much the government contribution, but the way in which Australia's corporations are yeah. engaging with universities and engaging with the research and development. So if I look at the OECD stats, Australia's public R&D spend seems about, uh, about, the, about on par with the OECD, but our private sector R&D spend is well down. If I go for a walk around uh, the streets of uh, Stanford or MIT in the United States, I'll run across all kinds of spin-off companies started by uh, by uh, students or faculty uh, that have, uh, are working in with uh, those companies are located near the university because they're working with the university. Uh, if I wander the streets around Australia's top universities, I, I run across a whole bunch of uh, lovely cafes, uh, not so many spin-off businesses. There's some, uh, UTS Sydney is working hard on getting a, uh, an innovation or entrepreneurship experience for half its students, and I certainly commend them on that. Uh, but I do worry about the lack of engagement between corporate Australia and uh, University Australia in boosting innovation. Uh, you've, uh, you've put forward a range of ideas as to how we do that, uh, but that for me is, is what, uh, at the heart of... Uh, how we build prosperity and, and continue to get that productivity growth in coming decades. Can I just say one one thing? I think Please. our aspirations should be higher than to be in the middle of the pack of the OECD. In terms of the public spend? No, yes. I yes. take, that, take that point. Uh, there's been uh, quite considerable increases in, uh, in research funding, uh, but I do think that when there's political meddling and the allocation of that research funding, as we saw uh, in the, the intervention in uh, Australian Research Council uh, funding under the former government, that that really undermines the system and uh, uh, was delightful in the, uh, the last sitting of Parliament to have a bill pass the Parliament that made very clear that the days of meddling in ARC decisions are over, uh, getting better arm's length funding decisions uh, and also getting more funding for uh, for innovative research, not just incremental research, is uh, is really important for Australia. Sonia. Um, hello. Thank you. Um, now, uh, economics is not my personal area, area of expertise, so there might be a lot of taken-for-granted knowledges in my question, which I wouldn't know about, if that makes sense. Um, the service economy is about taking care of people, about, um, you know, educating people, making us well, um, age care, creating community. Um, it, it seems to me that there might be two parallel economies generated um, with AI and its focus on productivity. So we have a service economy um, which is not about producing things, perhaps about producing ideas um, um, and a productive economy, which is about producing things and selling them. So do, do you think that those two economies might become a little bit more embedded or structurally um, entrenched in, in Australia or other places? I certainly think, Sonia, that uh, we haven't done a good enough job in designing economic statistics that capture the caring economy. Um, so Auckland University of Technology's Marilyn, Man uh, Mar Marilyn Waring has argued that uh, it is absurd that our national accounts capture the men who make handguns, but not the women who breastfeed babies. Uh, so better measuring the uh, the output of the economy is going to be really important. Time use surveys are a key part of that, uh, ensuring that we look at how people use their time. Uh, and the the value of unpaid work uh, is massive, uh, you know, plausibly uh, half or more of the value of paid work. Uh, so to not have it measured in our economic statistics can lead to it being undervalued in society, uh, and that one of the one of the real lessons for me out of feminist economics uh, has been the importance of measurement and the importance of of capturing the caring economy. 
uh, that uh, you know, was rec been recognised in equal value cases in recent years, uh, which have seen uh, workers in caring sectors such as the aged care sector uh, recognised for for having been under systematically underpaid uh, for no other reason than the fact that they're uh, they're female dominated. Andrew, thank you. Now, people, are you able to give us another ten minutes? Uh, I can. I, I have some caring duties of my own in terms of putting kids to bed. Could oh, we right. do another five? Would that be yes, all right? We can do another five. Yeah. All right. Now, um, Rosie. Oh, um, thanks a lot, Andrew. Uh, just um, some comments about um, uh, Farrah Farkas's latest um, contributions about the idea of you know collateralists and um, the the AI rentiers as we're reverting to a feudal model. I just just some thoughts on that. So I met with Giannis the other day, but uh, we uh, we talked largely about how funny it was that he'd uh, uh, been a lecturer in first year economics at the University of Sydney when I was going through, uh, rather than on the uh, the particular ideas about feudal economies. Uh, but you know, I certainly am concerned that at the moment the artificial intelligence engines uh, look like a fairly diverse sector, uh, but could become quite concentrated quite quickly. Uh, and I gave a uh, talk last year to the McKell Institute about some of the ways this could happen. Uh, the, producer, the, the data requirements are very large. The requirements in chips are very large. Uh, the potential for lock-in in staff is large. Uh, and all that together could mean that we see with artificial intelligence engines something akin to what we've seen with internet search. If you remember back to the uh, late 1990s, there was a whole plethora of search engines, uh, Yahoo, Lycos, AltaVista, uh, and they all went by the wayside except one, and now we've got a monopoly internet search provider. Uh, it could be the case that artificial intelligence goes the same way, and that would have potentially huge impacts on inequality. So that's something we need to be pretty careful on. Thank you. Jamie Gardner. Uh, thanks, Janet, and thanks, Andrew, for uh, fascinating insights into a whole very broad range of things about around economics. The one that the one that worries me a lot, and you just mentioned it a moment ago, is inequality. And looking at the vast inequality, not within, not within the sort of 80%, but within the 0.01% where uh, huge disparities of wealth exist and uh, therefore uh, great um, distortions, uh, in, my, in my view, come to be a problem. And I'm wondering whether you see uh, any, any usable way to to deal with that problem so that uh, our democratic and our social systems are not so distorted yeah thanks jamie it's a uh, it's a big challenge for the age and uh, uh, the work that thomas piketty and his team have done on the world inequality inequality reports have really highlighted this as a global issue uh, you see uh, what he calls the, uh, or what uh, Branko Milanovic has called the elephant, elephant curve, uh, where uh, there has been solid growth in those who are from about the 10th to about the 40th percentile of the world income distribution, uh, but then much more sluggish growth for the middle and working classes in advanced countries uh, who were sort of from the 50th to about the 80th percentile. Uh, and then above that, you see very rapid growth in incomes over the last generation uh, for those at the very top. Uh, and for those at the top of the top, as you say, Jamie, uh, growth in incomes has been stratospheric. Uh, there's a range of, uh, of you know, ways in which that can be addressed. Talked about competition policy before and the uh, checking of monopoly power because those at the top have tended to uh, make a, a disproportionate share of their gains uh, through 
uh, monopoly power. Uh, it's important to have a, a targeted social safety net, as Australia does, uh, and progressive income taxes. And I think also the uh, issue of multinational taxation is going to uh, be critical in, uh, in reducing inequality, uh, given that shareholding is so, so heavily skewed towards the most affluent. Um, so there are a few ideas, uh, but uh, like climate change, this is a big challenge for our, our era uh, and, uh, and one that all progressive economists are wrestling with. I think we better finish up there because Andrew's got to do his putting to bed and we put this to bed. Thank you very much indeed. This has been a wonderful discussion. It's a wonderful book. There's a discount for all those who attended tonight uh, and then the, uh, it's in the chat. Uh, we'll leave that up for a few minutes so you can order that. And can I draw your attention, Kimberly? could you put the slide up for our next meeting which will be in June, and in the in a world in which, um, sorry, she can't hear me. Kimberly, can you put the slide? I can up? hear you, and I'm just a little bit slow on the uptake on that. Right, she's but, slow on the uptake. I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting well, there. While she's while she's uptaking, um, in a world where there are um, fifty five wars going on, including Ukraine and Gaza. We thought that what the Labor Academy could offer would be for some of our key members, which is John Langmore and Tanya Miletic, uh, who have are running the peace building initiative at the University of Melbourne, to talk with Peter Khalil about peace building. So what do you do if you get a ceasefire? What happens next? Uh, and so that will be on the... Um, 7th of, uh, sorry, that's the wrong song time. It's on, it's in June. Sorry, it's on the 7th May. I'm sorry. It's on the 7th of May at 7.30. Uh, there we go. Um, and so uh, I hope that everyone will come to that. This is what, this is an event that's been requested by the um, McNamara FEA. Um, it, it's an area where there's a great deal of debate and angst over the Gaza war. So let's talk about peace building um, and rather than just arguing about the war. So thank you everyone for coming. Keep your eyes peeled for the Labor Academy. Um, we are growing gradually. We have a lot of trouble getting communicating with people. Uh, and I will certainly be looking to have Toby Walsh's his new book, A Year in a Year's Time, uh, as another one of our book club. So thank you and Good night. And Andrew, thank you very much. And I hope you're not late for bedtime. Thanks so much, Janet. Thanks, everyone, for a terrific conversation. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew.